Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll start the presentation. Uh, thanks for uh, coming. Welcome to uh, Engineered's uh, sponsored talk. Uh, I'm Alan Espinosa, and I'm a support engineer at Engineered. Today, I'll be talking about the aspects of deploying uh, Rails applications with, with Docker. Uh, my background is that I'm an operations engineer for the past few years. Uh, I've used Ruby mostly from my day-to-day -day work, so I've used Ruby back in the day when it was still popular to build uh, systems before Go came along. But it's still my go-to language of choice. Uh, I'm not really a Rails developer. More, but my last, last time I used Rails was six or eight years ago, I think. Uh, but I, I do a lot of uh, Ruby development, not just with web. So I'm the author of the Docker High Performance book by Packet Publishing. Uh, so uh, given Docker changes a lot, the, the book will probably have obsolete content the next few months. Uh, so I, when writing the book, I tried to make uh, sure what, what are the concepts that uh, can last through the, the Docker updates. And I, I, I'll do a bit of talk of that in, in this session. So I'll be talking about a bit uh, from uh, the second chapter of the book on how to optimize Docker uh, images. Yeah, so, and then I'll tailor it so that uh, you can uh, figure out how to uh, do your deployments on, with using Docker or with Rails in mind. So optimizing the, the way you roll out Rails in Docker. So when we say about uh, optimization, uh, so most of us think about having faster response times and uh, like having your controllers respond really fast so you have asynchronous workers spinning up those things. But uh, all in all, if you look at the broader picture, like performance is all about the improving the experience with our customers. So from the experience of our customers, you trace the value stream, then you can start doing things like refactor your controllers, your business logic based on the feedback you received from basically production traffic when interacting with your customers. Uh, so an another way to optimize down the line is like you can tune the middleware. So you, you can figure your unicorn workers or uh, Puma threads uh, and then set the memory allocation so that you're utilizing your machine. Uh, you can tune the SQL queries so queries are fast. Uh, so all these tuning, uh, you, 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 you don't operate in a vacuum. Like this tuning uh, is, in, uh, the, the tuning you make is informed through your instrumentation in your application and your machines. So you put in like lo logging, and then application metrics where they say like my application is okay, like how users are interacting. So it's even something as simple as Google Analytics can uh, give you a lot of insight. And then you can correlate that with uh, system metrics in which then you can use that to inform your scaling decisions. So you scale up your application to keep up with the demand from your customers, so you add you adjust the architecture, you add caching, you add capacity. So, uh, so like how many of you knows when do you need to spin up a new instance of your Rails application? How do you know the, the limits? So, yeah, so having good uh, uh, story about how you operationalize your application is important when optimizing. So you, you try to tune this, your application, so that it performs faster, but in the end, like you need to roll changes to your environment. So if your deployment and uh, process is slow, then this 
the tuning you might do now might be obsolete by the time you get to production. So there's also a need to tune the delivery of your software to production. So here uh, in this talk, I'll, I'll focus more about that. So even though I focus mostly on Docker, these concepts are uh, fairly broad and uh, general. So most early adopters like rode in the container hype. So now we're at starting to get past that point now. But so uh, in the end, like even though you can package Docker containers and stuff, like the the it all boils down to focusing to the what's the value of our application and Docker is only a tool to reinforce the way you deliver. So I, I was in our booth at Engineered earlier and I started talking to people on how they use uh, Docker and most of the time like there's a lot of like, okay, we, so, so now we're just starting at testing, uh, we're trying to convince people to run it in production and there's a lot of resistance with that and as an operations uh, person, like uh, I can understand some of that hesitance. So trying to uh, know what it means to change your stack to a container base will help people uh, convince if you think, really think Docker is for you because it all boils down to, help, to delivering your app basically. So in, in delivering the app, so it's normally, uh, normally we just talk about deployment, but there's also like the build phase. So uh, not ten, there's a natural tendency to think of the build phase as compiling code to a binary, like you have your C or Go code to be binaries. Uh, this doesn't seem intuitive at first for Rails and Ruby developers because Ruby is an interpreted language, but if you look at how uh, things are, like there's an equivalent of uh, binaries in Rails. So uh, when I say binaries, it means that anything that's needed to be dropped in the environment, like in production, in order to run the application. So uh, it's important to know what will get deployed so that in case I get paged at three in the morning, I know where to look at. So in, in Rails, like you have your, your gem packages, so they're a nice way to do, so you do a gem install in production and you're done. But uh, aside from that, like there's, it's not really uh, the final binary itself because when you do a gem install, sometimes if you depend on native bindings like Nokogri or the FFI library, you, you, you install, you compile stuff and produce the, the shared object files. So. The code in your Rails app is part of the binary, so the controllers, the models, and the routes. So if you don't get LS files, it's everything there is part of your binary. And then you have the dependencies, the, the gem dependencies for that application. So you do a gem install dash G or a bundle install. And then finally you have your Rails assets. So there's a lot of binaries when it comes to uh, making uh, a ready to run Rails app. So the, the thing with uh, Docker is that uh, it, it gives a nice, uh, I guess, interface to wrap our brains around because Docker has the notion of uh, a Docker image, the container which needs to run. So all those uh, uh, Rails binaries needs to be merge into one uh, binary called the Docker image that needs to be deployed. So you build it in your build server like Jenkins and then you push it to a, what they call a Docker registry. Basically it's an, a, uh, an artifact repository like Ruby gems where you, you, from git commit, you build the Docker image, you push it to the Docker registry and tell your uh, ops, ops teammates that, okay, uh, I have my image ready, you can now pull it and deploy it in. So when you, so there's just one thing that 
changes in your application, basically you add a Docker file which defines how the Docker image is built. Uh, so, so for those of you who who uh, who start just starting with Docker, so this is just a basic uh, Docker file to define the image. So here you have uh, the environment you want to, so from Ruby 2.2, and then you have you add your current directory in your build. Basically, it's all the files needed by Rails, and then you do a bundle install to pull in the dependencies and or you compile assets, and then in the end you you also define how to run your your application. So here you run real server or in production you should be running uh, Unicorn, Passenger, or Puma instead of Webrick. So in the build process, we have uh, something like this. So if you run the Docker build command and specify the name, so here I'm naming it Rails app. So you can see it's uh, starting to uh, compile the Docker image. So here you see it's, it's adding the Rails directory. Okay, here. The Rails directory and to your application and then after that it pulls in dependency like bundle, do a bundle install. So here you can see it's compiling uh, uh, binaries, native bindings to live XML because I have Macogre installed. And then here's just a, a, a short view of what the build, it will look like. In, so when you do a Docker build, it will run for a few minutes because you're pulling in uh, gem, you're downloading gems and you're compiling the gems. So here it took one and a half minutes. So the 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 a feature in Docker that helps in the build process is a the is its concept of a build cache. So if you run the same build again without any changes to the code, the the build will finish right away. So here it just took one second. So behind the scenes, you can see that uh, since there were no changes to your application, it's you, so since you built it earlier, it will reuse the cache to rebuild the image. Same with uh, bundle install. Okay. However, However, if you make a change to your application and uh, you make a small change, for example, you updated uh, the routes or you changed the model, uh, so the build will take uh, just as long because since in the Docker uh, build, uh, build step, so you, you had a new, new content in your application, so it created a new, uh, what they call it image layer. So the next preceding steps would need to be rebuilt because the dependent one is, uh, is, 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 is a new layer, so it had to run bundle install again. So this is uh, not, not much of a problem, problem if you're starting out, but once you uh, have a, a lot of teams or you're trying to do a large refactor, like trying to do a bundle install every, every time you make a change, starts to get painful, those one minute will start piling up. So what you can do is you can uh, optimize your uh, Docker builds, wherein you separate your application according to which one doesn't get uh, updated and which one gets more updated. So here I split my gem file and my actual application so that uh, I'll be able to exploit the cache more often. So it's the same concept as having a separate rake, rake task for your unit tests where they finish right away versus your integration tests where, where you need to spin up a database or a cache or anything, everything else in your, in your stack. So the initial build is the same, like around one and a half minutes, it will take just as long. But if you make a change to just your application, 
uh, it will finish as if uh, it, it was, nothing was changed. Well, actually something changed, but here the change happened at the later step when you added your application code. So if you didn't add anything in your gem file or gem file.lock, it will reuse the cache you had earlier, so it, it will greatly improve the, the build time. So in the, in the concept of like having a build process when making your Rails app uh, is being able to uh, get feedback as fast as you can if the, the, the artifact or the Rails binary that's ready to deploy is, is good, is actually good to deploy. So after producing the Docker image, you vet it through a series of tests like your unit tests, your integration tests in your uh, delivery pipeline and guarantee that it's good to go. And when it's good to go, you're now uh, off to deployment. So I found this on the internet where they su substituted the compiling with deploying since like the, uh, it, deployment takes most of the time, I think, especially on a Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 we've had a lot of customers, especially on a Friday afternoon doing the deploy and supporting them is, yes, yeah, yeah. So we've had customers who uh, uh, talk, talk to us for support where their deployment takes 30 minutes to finish and those things. So without, without a, a rapid deployment process, then the, you don't have the, valuable feedback of knowing if what you changed is actually useful for your customers. So, I'll, I'll show a, a, a few uh, items that can uh, delay the deployment process and uh, show like how this can be improved. So, uh, as an operations engineer, I don't really like doing this type of deployment process where you log into the server and do a git pull of the, the latest deployment and do a bundle install. Like, I guess it's a personal preference, but uh, it's, it's, well, one, it's slow because you have to, if something, there's a lot of change, you have to pull in a lot of gems and recompile everything, like in the build process. Uh, so. So sure, you can parallelize it across your fleet, so you have Capistran or like some other thing that SSH in parallel to do the bundle install. But uh, in terms of being able to roll out uh, the changes safely and, and the ability to roll back, so you want to do it little by little. So your, your, your parallelization is limited by how much you want to update at a time. So if you do a canary deploy, you want maybe to deploy one first and then next two, three, four, and, and until you finish your full fleet of uh, servers. So that will uh, slow down the, the process as well. So contrast with that to uh, deploying uh, uh, Docker images. So the, uh, Docker has a command called Docker pull, which basically downloads the image from the Docker repository. So the deployment workflow is just download the image and run it. So it's it's simplifying your deployment process. And if you have a, a canary deploy, you can uh, do that as well. So you, you, you're now bound to uh, how fast you can download your images from your Docker registry like Docker Hub, and not from uh, like other sources like uh, RubyGems. So I'll talk more about that in a bit. So in, in the end, uh, even though we rely on a lot of community uh, packages to make our application, it's still us who's ultimately responsible for the availability of our application. So like this was, this, this site got popular in Twitter during the, the NPM left pad thing, but it, 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 its concept uh, 
is uh, uh, very powerful for everything. So it's, the site is who owns my availability.com. It says, so if you refresh that, it will send out random uh, articles about availability and the concept of reliability and like the notion introduced by human operations. So it's a nice uh, site to check out if you want to do reading on uh, op operation related stuff. So, so, so this is uh, a typical uh, architecture of, well, it's not an architecture, but how the stream, the value stream goes. So we have our customers relying on our application to be up all the time because it serves their uh, own business usage well. And then conversely, we are dependent ourselves on other services for their availability for us to be able to make our application. So we're dependent on RubyGems, and if you're using Debian, you're dependent on the app mirror of app repository, and we, and we introduced uh, Docker in our stack, so now we're dependent on Docker Hub to pull our images. So uh, I guess this is where uh, uh, your operations teammates are having their hesitance because you're adding another uh, dependency that can cause things to break. So, so if you're relying on uh, these services, it's good to be able to uh, vendor them and not rely your deployment process on them so that even though RubyGems goes down, Docker Hub goes down, your application uh, can still be deployed or you can still roll out changes if you need to update things. So you don't need to declare a snow day or something like that for your team. And uh, so, so what uh, I, I like to do when, uh, even on my dev machine, is to add proxies everywhere. So there's a notion in, in, in corporate environments where developers hate the configuring the proxy settings for their uh, uh, for their development environment. Uh, and there's a lot of friction there, but uh, like, so there was a talk yesterday from Jamie V. Diesel about uh, trying to understand ops teams, so where they come from and what's the source of the grumpiness. So trying to understand and show empathy uh, goes a long way and we can all, you can also learn a lot of stuff from our uh, teammates in other departments. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here, uh, actually in my dev machine, I have like three proxy servers for each type. So I spin up servers, I have uh, a mirror for app and then I have a mirror for a Docker registry and I have a mirror for my Ruby gems. So you can do, you can do these things in your dev machine or your Jenkins server. So you can, so Bundler has the, the mirror setting, which basically says if in your gem file, if I'm, if I have a source rubygems.org, it will download to, to another endpoint. So it's like man in the middle attacking your dev environment. And it produces this, yeah, it produces this entry in your global uh, user level uh, bundler config. Uh, so like I also do this one in my gemrc. So I actually remove rubygems.org in my gem sources and add my local one. Uh, and then I install like any of these proxy repositories. So you have Artifactory and Nexus, Docker registry for Docker images. So they, they, they off, off, out of the box, uh, like Nexus and Artifactory supports different formats. So, so, I, so I actually just install one, like just Nexus because it's free. Like, so I have my own uh, proxy Ruby gems and uh, 
and my own uh, Docker registry. So when I do a, a bundle install, I, it's, it's, I'm not dependent on downloading images all the time. So actually when I do development, uh, I can do a, a git clean dash fd and then it will remove all the cache gems, all the compiled gems, and then I do a bundle install again and I can install it right away. And uh, not depending on the dependencies also, uh, also works for databases. So if your database is down, then uh, your, the application, the Rails application, should be able to uh, uh, degra uh, degrade uh, successfully. So you, your, your master database may go down, but so people cannot post updates to their uh, like, uh, accounts. But if you have a slave database, then the Rails application can read from there, so you can still serve the request on a read-only basis. So you have, uh, you, everything doesn't just fall down. Like it's bit by bit falling down, but you can, it's like if you have a hole on the ship, you can start, uh, what you call that, bucketing out the water while another part of your team does the plugging in of the hole. So it's, it's uh, trying to handle failure uh, gracefully. So uh, in conclusion, uh, even though containers and rails abstract, ab abstract a lot of information from us so that we can focus on actually writing our app, like it still need, we still need uh, uh, a good uh, reliable infrastructure that we can build upon. Otherwise it all crumbles down if you have bad foundations. So it may be the, the magic and the, the elegance of Ruby and rails that attracted us to our careers, but uh, growing as uh, uh, engineers, uh, knowing the magic behind what we're using and knowing the higher level first uh, principles can, can help us uh, accommodate uh, changes in our stack, in our application when doing a deploy, uh, debugging things when things are on in production, uh, knowing when things fail. So uh, knowing all these things uh, will have, uh, will make us have a more uh, operable uh, application environment so that we can, fo we can focus on the serving, on serving the needs of our uh, users. And yeah, with that, uh, I'm done with my talk, and if you have questions, I can take them. And if you go by our booth in the engineered booth, uh, we have limited copies of my uh, Docker book. So if you pass by, and you can talk to me and te talk, uh, tell me about your story in using Docker or convincing management to use Docker, and so on. Thank you.